people in whatever business or industry we are in. That's based on our people skills. And can those people skills actually be lost in translation when we're communicating cross-culturally? Can our effective communication skills be lost in translation? Our communication skills are people skills that help us effectively express ourselves and achieve our outcomes. And what makes us an effective communicator in one cultural context may not actually work when we're interfacing with a culture different than our own. And we have to be able to figure out and to learn what's necessary to adapt. And so today we're going to take a look at that adaptation. But before we do, let's take a look at some business models that were very successful in their cultural context and tried to roll out into a different cultural context without thinking of that adaptation. McDonald's is one of the most famous of these. McDonald's was very successful in the United States, and they tried to roll out into different areas of the world, and they found out very quickly that people were looking for something different, that not everyone would appreciate a Big Mac. For instance, in parts of the world in India, there was something else that someone would want. They did not want to eat beef. Or in France, they wanted to be able to have beer with their lunch rather than a milkshake. And McDonald's, Disney, Starbucks, they're all rolling out with a model that didn't really have an adaptation to it. And what they found was that that model wasn't going to work. And so they had to back off of what they were trying to do and do three things. And these are the same three things we need to do when we're thinking about our cross-cultural communications. We need to re-examine our values because our communications are really value-driven what we look for in a communication, how we communicate. Those are values driven based on what our values are. And we sometimes have to reexamine the values to, to try to understand if someone else is valuing something different, what is that going to mean with regards to communication. We have to challenge our biases. And sometimes those biases are very unconscious. And we have to be able to step back and challenge those with regards to communication and what it might look like and what it might feel like communicating with someone cross-culturally. And thirdly, we have to be able to suspend our judgment. And that can be one of the most difficult things to do because we're programmed to really look for certain things in communication. And when those things may not be evident, when they don't show up, we oftentimes make the mistake of judging. And we oftentimes actually make the mistake of judging the person communicating with us when in actuality we just have a difference in terms of the way in which we message. And so we're going to talk about all of, all of those things today and try to understand how language, values, context, and expressiveness all will affect our communications. And then how to explore how to manage those differences in email. We're doing so much of that cross-culturally on the phone, and face-to-face. -face. We like to liken things at Cairo to the iceberg model. And I know many of you are familiar with this. But I'd like to talk about communication with regard to this for a moment. If you've traveled, and I'm sure most of you have traveled to an environment very different than your own, the first things that necessarily impress us are like the part of the iceberg that we can see, the part that juts out of the water line. And most of those things are very important, but they are very obvious. For instance, if I go to Japan, I may notice that I'm greeted with, in particular situations, with someone bowing towards me. And that's something not something that I customarily do in the United States. It's important that I recognize what that obvious action is. But what's even more important is that I recognize why that's happening. For instance, in Japan, someone may give a bow to someone else, and that links to that value of respect. And so where it's important for me to, to understand that they may bow, what's more important is that I understand what's driving that. And that is that, that value and adherence to respect, and especially for certain relationships and hierarchies. And so if I'm going to be effective cross-culturally, it's more important that I understand what is behind the vow. What is the cause? What is the reason? And it's the same with our communication. 
when we receive a communication, we might look at it like we look at the top of the iceberg. But what we have to do is figure out what's causing it to appear this way. Could it be that someone codes a message differently than me? Could it mean that they are driven by a different value than I might be? Could it be that they have a different adherence to power? And so they're going to communicate me, with me in a particular way because of that. At Carroll, we've been researching cross-cultural communication for over 12 years. And a couple of the things that I think are important to think about before we actually get started in today are these. The first one is that we don't see things as they are. We actually see things as we are. When I open an email from a cross-cultural client, I read it with my lens. My values are at play. My level of expressiveness or restraint, the way I've learned to form a message, all are going to influence how I receive that message and how I send messages. And it's important to be able to be aware of what our lens is, because our lens is going to be the first lens in which we look, look at a message through. The second thing and this that we have really discovered and realizes at play with regards to communication is depicted here in a picture of, a, of an air crash, actually, of Korean Air in 1999. And this crash, there were over 200 people killed on this particular day. And they couldn't figure out why this plane went down. Um, there didn't seem to be a lot of weather issues. They knew there was some kind of mechanical issue, but they didn't think it should be severe enough to cause this crash. Well, as they got investigating it and they got into the voice box that was uh, for the pilots, they listened to the conversation between the two pi pilots. And these both pilots were Korean, and they both were speaking their native language. They were communicating to each other in their language. And what they found, pilots are trained for one set of protocols when there is going to be a difficulty in an, in an airplane. Co-pilots are trained with a different, different set. And they are supposed to adhere to those protocols. Those are their technical skills. What they found was the pilot actually told the co-pilot to do something different than he was technically trained to do. And he followed. And he followed because in the Korean culture, that level of respect and deference to hierarchy is so strong. And language carries with it the innuendo of, of following that. And so what actually happened was he followed the instructions of the pilot, and the plane went down. And Boeing got very excited about it and did a lot of research and began a lot of cross-cultural communication training. And in fact, they started to take uh, language they wouldn't let two pilots speak in their native language because of how strong and how in what an influence that language would be. And what this tells us is that our national cultural values, the things we're conditioned to look for and to, and to, to believe, those things are going to trump our technical expertise. And that is also going to come at play in terms of our communications and how effectively we're going to be able to do that cross-culturally. The way that we are comfortable forming a message may be different from how someone else is. If we're not aware of those things, those characteristic values and beliefs, if we're not aware of them, we can find it difficult to suspend judgment or to realize what our own unconscious bias might be. So we're going to take a look this morning. We're going to take a look first at values and how they influence our communication and why we need to be aware of them with regards to communication. And so I'd like you to think just for a moment if you, and it doesn't really matter what your cultural background is, I would imagine today you're sitting in the United States. So what I'd like you to think about is what do you think are three or four US values? Values that people who are here in the United States who are brought up in the United States kind of learn as a way to survive in this environment. Because that's really what cultural values are. They are whatever messages we get that help us survive in the environment in which we're born into. And that's why they differ culturally, because we have different regions of the world. But what do you think three or four of the US values might be? 
I'm going to share with you what research would tell us. These are just a few of them. Speaking up, efficiency and speed, individualism, and equality. And as we talked, we learn the values based on the environment we, we need to survive in. And if you think of the country, the United States, as it was settled, the people that came here did need to be able to exemplify these values. If they couldn't speak up, they would not get what they needed. If they weren't very fast, and in the early years, maybe it was putting a crop in, they would not be able to eat and survive. They were individualistic. They left their families. Um, probably, for many of them, never saw them again. And this country was founded on a sense of equality and, and a desire for equality with regards to several, several things. So when we think about it, these are values that we are culturally conditioned to expect. And so when it comes to communication, if I value speaking up, I'm going to expect that someone that's communicating with me also values that, and that they will speak up, that they will tell it like it is. They will not have any qualms about that. If it's efficiency and speed that I value, I'm probably going to monitor the pace of my communications. And I might have expectations around when I would get an email back or when someone would phone me back. If I value individualism, I probably feel I have a right to say what's on my mind individually, or I have an expectation to do that. And if I have a value of equality, I might not monitor my communications in terms of who I'm communicating with. My email to the president of the company might look the same as the email to my colleague, and I won't have an adherence to an attention to that with regards to my communication. So these are some things that, these are some ways that values color what we look for in communications and actually color what we judge when we don't see these things showing up or communication showing up in this particular way. And they influence how we will, how we will message each other. Now if I take a look at a very different set of values and what those values might be, let's take a, a contrasting look. And if we look at some key Chinese values, we'll just use that one as a contrasting look to values that would be US values. If I am learning to survive in that environment in China, I may have learned that I am going to preserve faith or social status of someone. I'm not going to have someone lose faith, and I don't want to lose faith inside of, of someone else. I value harmony and relationships, and I value hi hierarchy. It is important to me to be able to defer to someone who has a higher stature than myself. All of these things are going to also influence my communication so that I'm going to communicate in a way that is going to preserve faith. And that might mean that I'm not necessarily going to tell someone something that might be seemingly disagreeable. That would go against that value of faith, and that's an operating value for me. If it's hierarchy, I'm going to communicate perhaps very differently to different individuals based on the status that I perceive that they have. Family is a, is a huge value in terms of that. I'm going to look for perhaps people to communicate around family. It's not that family isn't the US value, but we demonstrate it through our value of individualism. So as you can see, my communications are driven by different values. And so what we have to consider is how can we appeal to the values of the person that we're communicating with cross-culturally? What is important to them? What are they looking for in a message? What will be something that they would not do? What's something that they would do in a communication message? How does that help me adapt my natural style of communicating so that I'm able to message them in a way in which they receive the message I intend. And so values and communicating to values and adapting so that we can speak to someone's values are going to make our communication go forth with a lot more ease. So that's the first consideration. The second consideration that we want to talk about is not the value, but the context. How is 
the communication really coded. And we have, if you would think of a continuum, we have a continuum. And on one end, we have high context communicators. On the other end, we have low context communicators. And cultures line up somewhere along this continuum with regards to how they code their communications with regards to context. So let's talk about that. A low context culture is a culture where communications, if I have to say something, I say it very directly. I use just the words that I need to use in order to get my message across. I'm very specific. And in low context cultures, you'll hear things like, well, just tell it like it is. Get to the point. It's very explicit. So if I need to say, we need those books by Tuesday, I just say that. And that is all that I say. And the words convey the message. As you can imagine, with some of the values that we talked about with regards to US, US is a very low context. We're not the lowest context on the continuum, but we are a very low context culture. On the other end of the spectrum, however, are high context cultures. And these cultures communicate indirectly. And there's a lot of context around the message. There's a lot that is put around the message that is to be sent. In a high context culture, information goes through very informal channels. What information I receive is going to be based on the trust that I've established and the relationship I've established with the communicator, the identity uh, in the group. Much of the communication is nonverbal, and nonverbals are very important, and things like silence will communicate. In high context cultures, you might hear things like, well, we can look at this again. And that actually means, no, we're not going to look at this again. A yes, that means no. One of the, one of, uh, the high context cultures, Mandarin language with China, high context culture, there isn't a character in Mandarin that will say no directly, just like we have an O in, in English, there is not a character that would just be that explicit. And so it's a very implicit kind of coding with regards to language. So let's take a look at what this looks like. If I say in US, I don't think that's such a good idea. That's a very direct, low context statement. If I wanted to make that more high context, I would say something like, do you think that's a good idea? Are there any other ideas out there? I like most parts of that idea. Those are high context ways of saying, I don't think that's such a good idea. You can imagine how confusing this can be in cross-cultural communications. Because if you've got a low context communicator communicating with a high context communicator, they can definitely miss their messages. Now let's take a look at a high context message and what it actually means. That is a very interesting viewpoint, which could mean I don't agree. We need to talk more about this, or you're wrong. So as you can see, just in the way a message is coded, high context with a lot of context or low context, it can cause some confusion in terms of what the real message is. And the problem here is when, we, when we're talking about communication and separating the person from the communication problem, low context cultures can be perceived as rude because they are very direct. High context cultures, people who are from that orientation can be, can be misperceived as concealing things because they're not saying something directly. Those are misperceptions, but those are misperceptions based on that coding difference. Deborah, we, have, we, have, we have a question. Yes. They're wanting a few more examples of uh, low versus high context cultures, like in the sense when you oriented Mandarin. Um, could you give us a few more of those? I do. I've actually got a graph coming up that will show you a few oh, of the cultures scattered around, and I've got a, a reference for you. Would you like me to skip forward to that? I, I think we'll be fine if you cover it later. 
Yeah, I'm coming. Well, let's, let's go there because that's where they are. Okay, if you take a look at this graph, and this comes from a great source uh, for those of you out there managing across cultures, is the source. It's, it's here on the slide. Direct cultures to the left, indirect to the right. You'll see that even in the graduations of the bars, you're going to see differences. So when I'm, when I'm conversing with someone, client from the Netherlands, I can make the mistake because it, it's that much more direct than how I would be in the in, uh, U.S. I could make the mistake of saying, oh, they're so rude when I hang up the phone. They're not rude at all. They're just more direct in their communication. And if you look around, this is not the entire graph. I just put a smattering of cultures that I thought um, might be pertinent to, to those in the audience. But you can see there, United States is on the second bar going over towards the right. We get over to China. Then we get to India, Japan, where we get even more indirect. And we're going to talk a little bit more about coding later. But those are some examples there. The other consideration are our nonverbals. Because we don't tend to monitor our nonverbals in a in a low context culture, high context cultures do. And so a lot of times if we're from a low context culture and we're not monitoring our nonverbals, we're not even realizing that we are messaging. And we need to be to be able to be conscious of that. We also need to be able to monitor and pick up the nonverbals with regards to what we need to receive. And so nonverbals can be, be extremely important. Things are said with silence. Things are said with nods, and a lot of times if we're not attuned to that, we don't pick up that messaging. So here's our graph again. And now we're going to take a look at what seem to be some of the more obvious um, barriers, I guess, to communicating cross-culturally. It's kind of interesting, though. Context and values are really inherent in our cultural communications, and those are the things we miss. And yet, at Terra, we do a lot of, of surveys, and with the Intercultural Developmental Inventory, I get a lot of responses from people who feel that actually language, just the difference in language, is their biggest barrier. And the danger to that is actually value-driven communications and context-driven communications are as much if not more um, of what pro of provides a barrier with us communicating effectively across cultures. But let's take a look. We're going to take a look here at a, a couple different things that people comment on that they find challenging with regards to cross-cultural communications and being effective. One of the the first one, you know, the title there, language, I'd like to point you to an article that just came out on June 2nd, uh, Huffington Post, Six Multilingual Benefits That You Only Get If You Speak Another Language. This is an excellent uh, article if you're interested in it. It talks about the things, the nuances we're able to really pick up on, the, the fact that they say that half the world um, is now able to, to speak more than one language. I, you know, sometimes we don't see that, uh, especially here in the Midwest, but, but that proficiency is, is gaining. The fact we can notice and appreciate things that are lost in translation, if we do understand the language, we feel a different sense of connection, of heritage. And our intercultural interactions can actually go very much, much more deeply if we're able to communicate. And also the self-expression that we're able to, to have is going to be intensified if we're able to speak the language. And so anyone who is working with a particular culture, some kind of acknowledgment and learning of the language can be so helpful because of the nuances that you're going to be able to pick up. But language. The context, the values are all going to influence. Language is, is one of those things that can enhance, but we can still effectively communicate cross-culturally even if we don't know the language. Dialect can sometimes get in the way. And what we don't often realize is 
if there's a particular culture that we are communicating with, to start to train our ear with regards to the dialect, to start to watch movies where people might be speaking, if you're speaking English, and they might be speaking English, but maybe perhaps they're, they're originally from India, and so you start to hear the cadence of the dialect, and you begin to hear the nuances of the dialect and the way in which it affects the vocal quality, and you can begin to train your ear to be able to pick up the message, and the dialect isn't going to get in the way. Slowing communications down can also do that. But training our ear, and not training our ear to turn off when the dialect isn't something that's familiar for us, but actually training our ear to be able to listen to it and to understand it. And that is something that's possible for us to do. Translation. I want to talk about translation and language for a minute, and I want to share with you an activity that it's really helpful to help people if you're working in your organization cross-culturally and language is an issue or dialect is an issue in translation. I want, I want to show you an activity here in a moment that might be helpful. But translation can be translating when we're trying to listen to another language or even if we're speaking the same language. I was just on a holiday in Sanibel Island with my children and my daughter lives in London and her boyfriend is English, and he was, we were getting so excited before the trip uh, to all be together, and I emailed him and I said, oh, I'm so anxious for us all to be together. And he went to my daughter and he said, your mother is anxious about this trip, and to him, the translation in his context of what anxious would mean, in, to me it was excited. To him it was that something was wrong. And so it can be as simple as that in terms of translation and not recognizing someone's alternative context. The so we have a question, and if you don't mind me interrupting. Yeah. Um, it says, do you find that a person with English as a second language, the low context is more effective in communicating? Hmm. Thank you for that question. I suppose it depends on the context of their original language. Um, if you are speaking in US, if you can learn to be more low context, it's probably going to be effective for you, an effective adaptation for you to be able to do that. Now, that being said, you know there's an element of your own natural communication style that may, may or may not make that possible. But it depends on the language that was their first language. Because it, if it's a if it's a low context language, it's not going to be that much of an issue. If they're from a high context orientation, it might be helpful if they can make some of their statements more direct and not interpret direct statements incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about translation, let's go there for a moment. If we are, uh, this is a great activity called Lost in Translation, and it really points out to us how challenging it is. It's challenging if I'm trying to pick up a message and it's not my first language, and it's, it's challenging if I'm trying to give a message to someone who the language I have is not their first language. And this is a great exercise to help people recognize how challenging this is for both parties. Um, if you try to tell a story, and you every time you use a verb, you have to use another one. So the example here is, I got out of bed, arose, and stumbled, plodded to the kitchen. I brewed, perked some coffee, and made cooked breakfast. This is very challenging to do, but in actuality, this is what the mind is going through when it is trying to communicate or receive a message, and it's not the first language, because it's trying to get the meaning and be able to give the meaning. And when we do this in classes, I find that people will say, are we done yet? Can we be done yet? Because it's very tiring, and it's very hard to think that, that clearly, and it's very hard to message accurately because you're so concerned with trying to get the accurate word. And this is such a great activity for people to realize the, the real challenge it is and how hard it can be for someone to communicate 
in a language that isn't their own and how challenging it can be if you're trying to communicate with someone and your language is not their first language. And I think we have to be sensitive to the fact that the particular verb, how close will it be to what the actual message is? And so we have to do a little bit of troubleshooting around that in terms of asking questions, doing some clarification, um, making sure that we're paraphrasing, all of those things that are going to help us make sure we're getting the message the way someone intended it for us to receive. This next concept also has to do a little bit with language and, and, and also a little bit with coding. And it's such an interesting uh, concept is that we really do organize our messages differently cross-culturally. And this particular Kishu Tenketsu is a style of writing that's um, prominent in Japan and in some Asian, Asian cultures. And it's a very different way of going about making a point than we might make it here in the United States. When we, when we speak in English, we kind of start with a conclusion. We need to get those books by Tuesday. Now, if we take a look at this particular communication, which is an example of something written in this style, let's read this. I'm really worried about all the papers the conference participants will receive. It may be very inconvenient for them to have to juggle all those papers. They could become frustrated. We need to do something about it, don't you think? I'm sure everyone will expect it. I was thinking, could we give people something to hold the papers? Is there enough money in the budget to buy some bags? This particular style, the key is the statement of the topic. And when a message is organized this way, the statement of the topic comes first. And that's the worry about all the papers that the conference participants will receive. The show is the, the discussion, the discussion around what's going to happen because of that. The 10 in the 10 Ketsu is where the message shifts and the viewpoint changes. And the ketsu is the conclusion. Is there enough money in the budget to buy some bags? Now, if we were speaking in English, we would start with that. We would start with the conclusion. So you can imagine if you have someone from an orientation where they've learned a different way of styling a message, a different way of organizing a message, where the conclusion doesn't come first. Imagine this is your email that you're getting. And imagine you're from a low context culture. All you're needing is, is there enough money in the budget to buy some bags? We need some. And yet what you're getting is this whole discussion, which is equally as valid. It's just a different way of forming a communication message. So analyzing who we're communicating with, what might be their style? It might not be that they start with the conclusion. That might not be how they logically organize the message. They could be coming at it from a completely different style. So what does this say to us in terms of what we need to think about? Harvard Negotiation Project says that to achieve any outcome with another person, to achieve our outcomes effectively, we have to be able to separate the person from the problem. That is step one. And we have to be able to do this in a way that builds and preserves relationships. There is nothing that can endanger a relationship more than an inability to communicate. It is going to challenge a relationship. And so having an adherence to what is it, what's the What's the possible value system of the person I'm communicating with? What might be driving? What are the values that they're looking for in their communication that might be driving their communication? How do they context the message? Are they more low context? Are they more high context? Um, am I patient or am I careful in my translation? Without an awareness, and a consideration of the other party, we can't separate the person from the problem. And I would say we really can't achieve the outcomes we need to achieve. And the communication is going to be a stopper. So what are some effective things that we can do? Try to speak to values. We had a gentleman who came to class who was working with 
um, actually some people from India, and was his particular job was to get some contracts signed. And we were working on the value differences between the U.S. and India, and it had never occurred to him because he was really driven by efficiency and speed, and he was driven by some of the other U.S. values that had never occurred to him that he might want to communicate to this person towards their values. And one of the values with regards to the Indian culture, a generalized value, would be the value of family and the relationship. And so instead of going in and just asking for the contract to be signed, which is what he found himself usually doing and trying to get it done quickly, and he oftentimes found that there was resistance to that, he knew that this particular person went on a vacation, or had his family over, actually, and they had some holiday time together. And he started the conversation with asking about that. And they were talking about family. He was relating to him about his family. and then. Partway through the conversation, the gentleman said to him, didn't you bring something here for me to sign? He got his outcomes achieved, but he appealed to the other person's value system in terms of communication. And that can be really important um, to be aware of and to do when we're communicating cross-culturally. If we can kind of match the context and the style, so if we can look at our communications, look at someone, how, how they formulate a message, and try to figure out, are they more low context? Are they more high context? What's the style in terms of which they present a message? Even in the United States with gender differences, we're, we're low context generally in the United States if we're speaking English, in, unless we, are, we have a cultural conditioning from another culture. But women tend to be more high context, even though they're low context, more high context than men. There's a, they call it scanning. And women will be very high scanners, they say, in communication, and men low scanners. So a great example of this is uh, if a woman, let's say she wants her husband to uh, pay attention to Valentine's Day, she might do a high scan, and she might present these concepts to him like this. You know, there's a lot of wonderful chocolates out in the stores this year for Valentine's Day. And she might say something like, I bet the restaurants are going to be all reserved on Valentine's Day. She's going around and giving a whole lot of information about this without saying it directly. Her husband, who would generally be a low scanner, isn't hearing the message and wouldn't necessarily pick that up in that way perhaps pick it up better if she just said what it was she wanted or what the expectation was around that holiday and took it into more of a low scan. So matching the context, recognizing the context and the style can be extremely helpful. We don't paraphrase enough. Saying back to someone and not being afraid to do that when we're communicating cross-culturally. You know, if I heard you correctly, this is what I heard and saying it again did I get that right? Those kinds of punctuation points in communications can be very helpful. And as long as our vocal tone is sincere and as long as we are not impatient with the person we're communicating with, that paraphrasing can be really, really helpful because we can clear up any of the things that might be lost in translation. Asking open-ended questions. I don't know what it is about cultural difference, but we don't tend to ask each other questions. And it's almost we stay away from that or that it's taboo. Asking open-ended questions. You know, walk me through. Walk me through that example again. Or tell me more about what you're thinking. Those are open-ended prompts. Having someone talk more to us, that way you can pick up on value pick up on context. You can pick up on style. You can start to learn. Most of us are communicating with the same individuals. And so being able to learn those patterns is going to help us. And asking open-ended questions around what the message that you're receiving can be really, really helpful. We always want to explore your own values. Your values are going to drive what you expect people to show up providing you with, how fast you feel an email should come back to you, all kinds of things are going to be reflective of your values. And if you know those, 
then you can analyze when something shows up looking differently, what value is this really triggering in me, and is there a way I can re-examine that? Or do I, can I have a conversation around that, why that's important to me, and perhaps create a better template for us to communicate. We have a hard time with not jumping to judgment. And so one of the things is really when communications come at us that we don't understand, to step back and try not to evaluate them, but try to just describe what we're seeing or hearing to ourselves. Describe it, be descriptive. And then try to think of five different reasons why it might be formed this way. And then make our evaluation. There's so many things that really do color our communications, even personality types, um, and the things with regards to our personality, let alone culture. But when it's a cultural context, just step back and, and describe what's happening without that evaluation. And if we don't understand, just asking, again, the open-ended questions rather than jumping to conclusions. It is, it is really our goal to recognize the explicit and implicit values, to understand their impact on communication, to adapt our messages appropriately to get the best results, and in our organizations to work with others to develop shared understandings to enable good collaboration and generate value. Nothing is more limiting than when we find ourselves communicating cross-culturally and instead of identifying shared understandings, we judge or we assign to a particular group of people that it's, it's, it's not, an effective, um, not an effective working environment. That's just totally not fair. We really want to develop those shared understandings and to refrain from that judgment. And our capacity to do that, to generate more accurate perceptions and adapt our communication to a cultural context is going to rely on that attention to language and values and context. And we didn't talk a lot about expressiveness, but whether we're more restrained in our communications or whether we're more expressive, that can also be misperceived. And so we don't want to perceive someone's expressiveness with our own lens if theirs is different than ours. All of these things um, are so key in order for us to be able to really be competent as a cross-cultural communicator. Before I close, Nathan, what questions do you think might be out there? Do we have any questions from anyone right now? Uh, we don't have anything that's coming in right now, but we can go ahead and we could pause for a moment to see if something does come in. Um, did you want to go ahead and start to wrap up, and then I'll go through a couple announcements so they could type? Great. The only message that matters, and this really comes from our speaking presentation skills class, but I, I just love this, this message. The only message that ever matters in communication is the message that is received. And if we think about it, it is our responsibility in our global organizations and society to, to really be able to be conscious of how to understand the things that we've talked about today, how to be able to leverage the differences rather than resist the differences, and align our communications to those things that we've spoken about so that the message we intend to send is the message that's received and that we're able to be responsible recipients of others' messages. And we are able to do that. And it's actually kind of a, uh, a very enjoyable journey when we start to pay attention to the things that would culturally code communication. So I want to thank you, Nathan, for the time today. And I want to thank the people that were on uh, the call today as well. We do have a couple questions coming in. I'm going to hit just a couple of quick announcements. If you are looking for that CISHRM credit, please shoot me an email. N is in Nathan, Ritz, R-I-T-Z, at DesMoinesMetro.com, and I will send you that certificate. Uh, June 19th, the Iowa Minority Business Exchange and Town Hall. You can find information on that at DesMoinesMetro.com slash events. Same thing with the multicultural reception on August 26th. 
DesWoinMetro.com slash events. I do want to say a quick thank you to the Greater Des Moines Partnership and especially the Diversity and Inclusion Council and Melissa Strum Smith who helped put this together. She's our Chair of Education this year. So definitely thanks to those of you who, who helped plan this and to Tarot International and Deb. Um, a huge thank you to you and I'll get to the questions that are starting to pop in now. <laughs> Uh, can you speak to gender differences, specifically males raised in a culture where women are not assertive, but now working in USA where women are? How can U.S. women best communicate with those men? Oh, can you repeat that one, Nathan? Yeah, it's a couple questions in one. The first part of that is speaking to gender differences, specifically males raised in a culture where, where women are not assertive, but are now working in the U USA where women are assertive. And how can U.S. women best communicate with those men who are used to women being in that non-assertive position? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, with regards to gender communication, uh, generally, even in U.S., there are some differences where um, generally men are conditioned to be um, more direct in their communication. Women are focused, they call it men are more report oriented, women are more rapport oriented, more uh, considerate of the relationship with regards to communication. You know, in U.S. business context, uh, there is no gender difference. And so I think the, the best thing for someone who is communicating with someone that might be coming from a different background is to create the best relationship they can so that they can discuss some of those differences. And to recognize when someone's communicating to you and perhaps you feel they have uh, been conditioned in a different context, not to interpret it with your own lens, not to react to it. Um, create an opportunity for relationship and dialogue so that it's in both parties' interest to really figure out, you know, to have a common understanding of where each is coming from. And I think the relationship orientation would be very important to focus on so that you could create that dialogue around what a message might be meaning to you, because someone's probably not intending for you to receive it that way. Okay, we have another question here that says, I do not speak a second language, but I do have communication with many other cultures. Several from my experience speak very quietly. Do you know why this is so, and if, and if there is a polite way to ask them to speak louder or more clearly? Uh, again, that's going to be uh, uh, where we talked about dialect and training the ear, starting to train our ear. And then also, I think, you know, just saying, you know, would it be possible for you to speak a little louder towards me. That will be easier for me to understand. If someone's speaking to you and, you know, they're normally wanting you to get the message that they are sending. And so just being able to ask politely for someone to do that, but also to, you know, I can't say enough about many of the cross-cultural communication differences exist because we haven't developed uh, as much of a relationship as we could, and that can be extremely helpful in terms of communication. And in U.S., we're not really relationship-oriented, we're more task-oriented, and yet the development of that relationship can be really helpful in terms of that communication, and especially if you go back and look at that high-context slide, what you, what is communicated to you is based on trust, the identity in the group. You want to develop that relationship so you can have those conversations that will help you um, aid the the actual communication or ask for what it is you need in that communication. We do not have any other questions coming in at this time. However, um, I do see that we have the Tarot website here and their social media link there, and I'm pretty sure that they can find contact with you through those. They absolutely can, and Whitney will be so pleased that you mentioned that. We're out there for you. She's posting all the time things that might be of interest to them, and if they go on www.tarot.com, they'll have my contact information, and I invite anyone with any further questions to please feel free to email or call. Okay, 
And same thing with, with my contact information. Uh, my, my job here at the partnership is working on the diver diversity inclusion initiatives through our workforce development arm. And so if you do have questions that would pertain to me or, or need assistance in any way, uh, please contact me, nritz, and that's R-I-T-Z, at Des Moines Metro. Com. So with that, thank you all for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Nathan.